Hi, Mr. Caruso. Hello, Mr. Caruso. I do a lot of interviews, man. I've never interviewed somebody named Michael Caruso, who is a first cousin before. What a pleasure. Pleasure being with you. You are the cousin we never knew. I know you get a kick out of this, but we saw everybody else at the family reunion every August at Bishop Park. And all we ever heard about this Michael Jerome, what's Jerome come from? My dad's middle name was Jerome. Okay. The Michael family. Jerome Caruso was off serving in the Navy. He was living in all these exotic places. Um, uh, stateside, I think Maine and Pensacola. I think you lived, uh, you lived in Saudi Arabia for a long time, maybe Italy. We did. We've, uh, we've actually lived, I think in, well, I've never really, not currently anyway, uh, done a mental review, but I think we lived in six countries for extended periods of time and, uh, probably seven different states for duty and traveled. And those were bases from which we traveled and worked and did other things. And some places uh, always assigned, right? It was a duty that you were offered and accepted. Oh, the, uh, while I was in the Navy, I was in the Navy for 26 years. And uh, uh, you can uh, ask for certain duty. And if okay. that's what the Navy needs, you might get it. Otherwise, they send you where they need you. So you lived in some places you maybe wanted to go and some other places you didn't care to go. Well, actually, I think we were pretty fortunate because uh, we did not have any place. Uh, I was I and I say we you'll hear me say we frequently because um, if you're in the military for an extended period of time, it's a it's a family affair. So when I say we, I certainly mean uh, my wife, Cindy, and, and myself, and to a certain extent, our son, who was actually born in a Navy hospital in Rota, Spain. Oh, wow. Well. So we're at the picnic at Bishop Park, and uh, this year we learned that Mike's been in basic uh, training, eating rattlesnake, and there was always some sort of like little exotic thing. And I remember you coming over our house for dinner, which we really appreciated. I know my dad really appreciated it because your time home was scant and short and you made the trip from Wyandotte to Trenton and had dinner with us and I never knew until you and I had dinner with the ladies uh, a couple months ago about the special relationship between you and my father. Well your dad was my godfather in addition to being my my dad's brother uh, there were uh, seven boys and five girls in in our our father's family and uh, uh, being uh, one of the first grandchildren, I had the good luck to kind of know them in their younger years. Uh, so uh, I had a good relationship with, with all my aunts and uncles, but a special relationship uh, with uh, your dad and a couple of the other uncles. So I find, and I look back on that as, as being uh, just an enriching thing in my life personally. Uh, as you may know, and <clears throat> I certainly think that uh, some of your your friends and followers know that uh, there are a lot of Carusos uh, running around, a very prolific family, and and uh, couldn't go very far without uh, asking someone asking you if you were related to this one or that one. So, uh, I uh, having having left the area, I never got the opportunity to be the one people ask about because I was gone, but uh, gone from my uh, not gone from my thoughts though. Thank you, sir. Uh, for orientation, for people that are, are watching, of the 12 siblings, 14 total, actually two died in infancy that we don't talk exactly. about much. Um, they died as babies. But your dad, Joe, was one of the older siblings. And my father, yes. Mickey, Michael, was one of the younger siblings. Yes. Um, so that's why you were one of the first, uh, <clears throat> first kids. I was the first Caruso grandchild. Were you? I didn't know that. First boy. All right. And what was the age gap between you and my dad? Your dad, if I get this correct, I think he was, boy, that's a good question. I should know that. Um, this may help. He was born in 24. Yeah. So uh, 16, he was 19 when, when I was born. Uh, I was 19 when you were born. Oh, wow. That's interesting. There's that. 
I've got your bio here, man. It's extensive, but rather than read it, uh, because it, it's fascinating, this life, it's like a life arc or a, your life work. And it's, I don't know if you think of it that way, but it's extraordinary, Mike. How do you talk about 26 years in the military and then your post, your post career at Booz Allen? Booz Allen, Booz Allen Hamilton is the full name? Booz Allen Hamilton is a management consultant company. Uh, it's uh, a company with many uh, clients of, of very different needs and, and uh, nature. But uh, I was in the part that uh, touched on uh, support for the United States military. Uh, at the uh, conclusion of the first Gulf War, uh, at the President King level, uh, the King asked the President, King of Saudi Arabia, asked the, the President of the United States, for some assistance to help them uh, have a better capability to defend and protect themselves and to be a better friend and ally uh, to uh, the countries to whom they were affiliated, one of which is the United States. So having agreed to this, uh, the kind of expertise they needed were the particular kind of expertise that the, the active duty Navy needs as well. So uh, the U.S. Navy turned to Booz Allen Hamilton and said, uh, we need uh, some support in this area and ask us to create a team of uh, experts to provide certain uh, assistance for the development of their Navy. And uh, that's how we got to be there in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, I had a team of about 125 uh, mostly retired uh, military specialists. And uh, we did a lot of things for them, uh, taught them how to fly helicopters, uh, to be instructor pilots in helicopters. So we had a little fleet of French-made helicopters being flown by Saudis and instructed by Americans. Uh, quite an international uh, uh, arrangement. It, and uh, the amazing thing is it worked. And uh, we had 17 patrol craft that they bought during the Gulf War, uh, for which they were not prepared uh, to receive and operate. So uh, on their behalf, my team accepted each boat as it was shipped in. We took possession. Uh, we flew a, flag, a Saudi flag, and we always had a Saudi on board. But, uh, my guys were uh, owning and operating it until each crew was trained and ready we'd have a ceremony and turn the keys, uh, so to speak, over to them and off they go. Uh, that project took several years. And uh, so we were flying with them, uh, out on the water with them, and certainly in the classroom with them, because one of the challenges with any uh, international student is we like to bring them to the United States and uh, put them through technical training First thing you have to do is you have to be able to not only speak English at, at the college level, uh, speak, read, and write it, but there's a lot of specialized English that goes in when you get technical training. So if you're going to be uh, uh, in flight training, you need to know a lot about uh, various specialized terms that are you're going to be exposed to in the classroom and in the airplane. So I had a team of 27 uh, teachers of English as a second language who particularly specialized in preparing these, uh, in this case, all young men to go to uh, flight training in the United States and other this, technical training as well. Yeah, this is interesting to me because uh, I don't understand world politics as well as I should. And I know that I know that we, we have relationships with every country and some countries, it's a more stable relationship than others. I always thought of Saudi Arabia as not one of the most stable. Well, um, you you could say uh, it depends how you define stability. The House of Saud uh, uh, unified the uh, uh, Abdulaziz Al Saud, uh, the the patriarch of the family, uh, unified uh, the, the Arabian Peninsula in the 1920s. Before that, it was a uh, uh, a hodgepodge of uh, Bedouin tribes of one size or another. And uh, he uh, brought them together and, and created the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Saud the Arabia, named after his family. And uh, the current king is his uh, grandson. 
great grandson. So uh, uh, it, it's in in Middle Eastern terms, it's an exceptionally stable country. <laughs> okay, <laughs> the government uh, can trace its lineage back several generations, which uh, there are parts of the world where that's considered a long time. Yeah. But anyway, uh, the bottom line is that uh, it's a, it's an area uh, you'll hear a lot of uh, terms of art used by diplomats and, and specialists in these matters. And one of them is uh, the United States has interests around the world. And we also have friends and allies. Allies are people with whom we have special defined relationships. And then there are friends with whom we have working relationships. And uh, in the case of Saudi Arabia, uh, President Roosevelt met with King um, Abdulaziz in 1945 in an infamous meeting in the Red Sea uh, and uh, pledged that we would help them uh, pursue common interest to the United States. And, uh, you know, there's no uh, shilly shelling about the, the common interest we had at that time and still to a certain extent have is oil. Uh, they're the world's largest producer of oil. They, they sit on the world's largest proven oil reserves. And uh, we not only have a need for oil, uh, we have a need for oil to free freely in the world market because uh, that uh, allows uh, free and open international trade, which is one of the uh, cornerstones of our economy and our political philosophy is that we support uh, a free and open market. And yeah. uh, since the beginning of our country, we, uh, we're a country of traders and uh, we trade around the world and we want the world to have stable energy and energy uh, that's free and available at uh, a fair and equitable price to everybody. So that's, a, that's an interest that we have and uh, it's one that we share in common with them. We also, uh, I think the uh, folks over at the State Department would say that it's in our best interest to have some friends and some allies in all the various regions of the world, whether it's um, Asia, Africa, Europe, uh, which is a long-standing place where we've had uh, friends and allies. But uh, certainly in the Middle East, uh, uh, we, we need friends, we need allies. And uh, to the extent that those friends and allies can be also share our democratic values, that would be even better. As it stands right now, there's only one democracy in that neck of the woods. So um, we are certainly friends and allies with Israel uh, and uh, be, being the only democracy there. And, uh, but we have interests with the others and, and uh, we have a relationship. Um, you, you remember the, uh, the accord that came out of the meetings in the Carter administration between Egypt and uh, uh, Israel that reconciled uh, some of the conflict over there. And uh, ever since then, there have been a series of uh, ongoing uh, discussions, negotiations. And, uh, it's in our interest for that region of the world to have uh, peace and stability. And that's a goal. Uh, it's a goal that has we've, that the world has fallen short of on occasion. Uh, we speak, uh, it's not very uh, peaceful there right, right now in one corner of the Middle East. But the Middle East is large and complex. So uh, there's a lot of things going on there. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking of these, what some people would call uh, and these people would be more myopic Americans or uneducated Americans. Um, I'll come back to Israel in just a second. But I know there's every uh, every year there's a bunch of students that are asking why uh, don't we supply Japanese military and defense? Yeah, we yes. Uh, well, well, Japan is both a friend and an ally at this point. That yes. doesn't, uh, uh, I'm not rewriting history. We were enemies uh, in World War II, yeah. uh, at the, but that that is in the past and, and uh, we've reconciled, found uh, areas of mutual interest and, and common goals. And uh, uh, I would like to just underscore the aspect of, we sell a lot of, military equipment to Japan. We don't give any 
military equipment to Japan, nor do we give any military equipment to Saudi Arabia. As a matter of fact, they pay retail. Uh, there are no discounts. Uh, but uh, And, and the, the kind of things that we sell around the world to various countries in the way of military equipment, uh, it, it is controlled, and we only sell those things which would not uh, have a negative impact on our own uh, military capabilities. So you may see that the latest and greatest technology that's developed by the Department of Defense uh, may not be shared with even um, fairly good uh, allies, but uh, might be shared with our closest allies. It depends. Uh, there, there's no um, common uh, label that goes on all of the countries around the world that we have a working relationship with in regards of national security. Don't you think that some people are, fail to see the, uh, the advantages of trying to get closer to people uh, in, in, a, in a communal aspect from a world stage. Uh, I think a lot of, I, I even have friends, I'm not proud of this, but I have friends that don't understand why we would build bridges with people that we've had trouble with in the past. I'm, I'm kind of proud of that in America as a democracy, we're trying to shore up those bridges if they need it. Yeah. Actually, uh, uh, there, there's a counterpoint uh, to that discussion. Uh, which says it's the very people with whom you have uh, problem areas that you yeah. need the, the most and the most careful dialogue and the most intense discussions if you're going to build bridges and pacify uh, the world. So it's it's not your friends you have to worry about. You should be in discussions with uh, your competitors. Not I won't call them enemies, but uh, there there are. There are countries uh, and people of the world that do not have our best interests at heart. And uh, uh, we have to be attentive to that. We have to look at, after our own interests uh, and uh, pursue those interests at, at the same time, uh, not uh, harm uh, someone else, uh, some other culture, some other uh, nation, some other group of people. Um, uh, there are a lot of uh, balls to juggle simultaneously, but that's the art of uh, diplomacy and uh, uh, re international relations, actually. Yeah, Thomas Friedman wrote famously about China. He said that they're both they're both uh, colleagues and competitors. China is neither a, a friend. They're not an enemy to the United States, but they're not. They, in in the way we define these terms uh, of statecraft, uh, they're neither a friend nor an ally. Uh, we are we do not have any uh, alliance obligations to them. We have, we're not in any bilateral, trilateral, multilateral relationship as we are with the European countries in NATO and other bilateral organizations that we we enjoy uh, uh, treaty relationships with. And uh, we are definitely, although we are trading partners, that doesn't mean uh, that their interests are are the same as our interests. Yeah, we, we've been in, in, we've been in as America, we've been in pursuit of uh, the China market for at least 150 years, and uh, the uh, pursuit of that market has uh, motivated uh, many many uh, American companies. Uh, if uh, with 2 billion people, uh, a population of 2 billion, if they all try a Coca-Cola once and don't like it, you still sold 2 billion bottles of Coca-Cola. So, uh, and you can extrapolate that to a lot of uh, companies that want to sell things, would love to sell things to the China market. But uh, there is a, a discussion. There has been uh, so a considerable amount of concern about whether or not we have uh, allowed ourselves to become dependent on certain uh, products that are constructed now in, in China that are essential to uh, operating and, and uh, running our economy, let alone if we were to come to a conflict. So uh, it's a balancing act uh, yeah. and uh, one that uh, is pursued every day uh, by various and sundry agencies of the United States. 
I want to ping pong uh, back to your uh, back and forth from your career. Five thousand flying hours, tons of training and teaching hours in the Navy. <clears throat> What's the best thing you learned in the Navy? Only Santa Claus can fly low, slow, and overloaded. Only Santa Claus can fly low, slow, and overloaded. Uh, my first uh, flight in an airplane was on an Eastern Airlines flight from Detroit to Pensacola. My next flight was looking out the window, seeing the trees get smaller in a Navy training airplane. So I did not come to uh, the program with uh, a lot of experience or, or uh, in aviation or, or background in it, but uh, uh, I was a clean slate on which the Navy uh, wrote what they wanted to and uh, went through flight training and uh, became a naval aviator. And uh, it was tremendous work. Uh, uh, early in uh, my career, I landed on an aircraft carrier. I thought it was pretty good stuff. When you're young and foolish, uh, you, you like to uh, explore new and different things. And I did. Uh, I carried, qualified twice uh, in two different airplanes. But then uh, I had requested and I went into uh, large airplanes. So uh, the airplanes I flew were approximately the size of a 737. And and uh, we went to various places in the world and, and carried out our missions. And, and uh, we would deploy for six months at a time out of um, the master bases in the United States. And, and uh, while there, we worked with um, uh, the, the U.S. Navy in, in pursuit of our uh, national security interests. It was good. Give us the years that you were flying so people have a, a bearing here. I joined the Navy in 1966 uh, and became a naval aviator uh, two years later. And uh, I was uh, assigned to uh, four different squadrons uh, over the years. And in the Navy, you, uh, as a basic concept, and this doesn't just apply to uh, aviation, but uh, the difference between one of the differences between uh, the Navy as military service and the other ones is that we have a rotation of shore duty and sea duty. And uh, I'm sorry, say duty, that again, Mike. Sea duty and shore duty. Uh -huh. So um, during your sea duty, if you're a ship driver, that's when you have your tour on a ship. Uh, if you're a submariner, you're off on your submarine. If you're an aviator, you're flying. And uh, But shore duty, uh, which comes every three or four years, uh, you, that's when you serve on a staff or as an instructor. Or uh, in my case, um, I did one tour in Washington uh, on the at the headquarters for recruiting. So I, I was there when we transitioned from the draft to the all-volunteer uh, service. And uh, so I... I got to know a little bit about uh, recruiting and why people join the Navy and uh, what keeps them in the Navy. And uh, that was interesting. But uh, most of my shortages were involved with uh, higher education. I, I, I'm, a I'm a graduate of three war colleges, the College of Command and Staff, College of Naval Warfare, both at Newport, Rhode Island, and the NATO Defense College, which is in Rome, Italy. Uh, I've also taught at two of those. So in addition to being a student, uh, I, I had a teaching tour at, at uh, the Naval War College, and I was on the faculty at the NATO Defense College, which is the, the postgraduate level school for officers from the various countries of NATO, the European yeah. countries. I know you're in Rotary in California. I'm in Rotary in Michigan. I have a yep. fellow Rotarian in my club who is somehow involved with the government. And I've asked him about it on a number of occasions, and I never feel like he answers my question. So it makes me think that he's doing some things he can't really talk about. But he did tell me this. I said, well, do you have, just looking for a foothold in the conversation, I said, well, do you have, I, I probably learned this watching Bugs Bunny and the Wile E. Coyote, do you have top secret clearance? And he looks at me and he says, I have top, top secret clearance. Well, I've, I've never heard that term. Uh, exactly. <laughs> uh, he might have been putting me on. Fundamentally, there, there are three levels of classification, uh, confidential, secret, and top secret. But then in top secret, there are many subcategories. Uh, and the, one, the thing that uh, uh, 
has been in the news, both in the uh, Pentagon papers that were uh, divulged by Ju uh, the WikiLeak papers, uh, Julian Assange uh, papers, and uh, the the Snowden uh, papers that were compromised and and, and distributed. Uh, Within the category of top secret, there are uh, uh, special uh, uh, sensitive information, SI clearance. Uh, SI is a category within top secret. And then within the SI category, there are code worded projects. So uh, these are, and in all of classification with the government, not just uh, for the military, but generally speaking, the philosophy is, you have to, in order to um, uh, work with it, certain information, you have to have both a clearance at that level and a need to know about it. Just having a top secret clearance doesn't mean you can see each and every top secret document. Uh, but so you get the uh, top secret classification uh, uh, security clearance. And then if you have a need to know, if you're assigned to a project for which you need certain information, then you're read into it, they say, or cleared to read and um, work with that information. So right. uh, it, it, if this, uh, the system works, but uh, uh, the failures are, uh, uh, are numerous and catastrophic when they do take place, there have been traitors, there have been spies, uh, and uh, there are times when uh, things are compromised. The only thing we seem to be able to absolutely keep secret is UFOs. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, there's a lot of people working on it. As you say, I, I through no fault of my own, accumulated 5,000 flying hours, and I was looking for those UFOs. I every, you were. And I never saw one. So I feel a little bit let down. You know the old joke that the the UFO. You ever notice the UFOs never stick around very long? <laughs> yeah, you become identified. There's no, a, uh, an, a a trend. An oh, sorry, Mike. They're no longer unidentified. Oh, that's right. They're FOs. Let's say they're I IFOs, identified flying objects. There is a trend. You mentioned Assange and Snowden. If you go back far enough, Ellsberg. There's a trend in our society to, uh, for a bit of hero worship with people who leak uh, classified information because uh, it was the right thing to do and these people are patriots. And uh, I, I think some of that comes from the journalistic trade where the fourth estate is, is, is their raison d'etre, as the French would say, their reason for existence is to expose corruption and and seek the truth you know um what the disturbing part of it is most people don't know, really know what happened with snowden uh, the best information they get is an oliver stone movie maybe snowden himself has given a lot of interviews i'm not sure that's the best place to get facts about what happened can you ever see an instance where someone who leaks confidential military information is doing the right thing or are they always a traitor well, uh, I always hope that uh, when someone like a Daniel Ellsberg, like uh, a Snowden, or even like an Assange, I, I hope they're doing what they, they do uh, for reasons that are pure and noble to them. Because to think they were doing it in cold blood, uh, the way some of the other uh, 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 traitorous folks who were doing it for money, uh, that that's really disappointing. Uh, but uh, I've been in this game, uh, I was in it for 40 active years, uh, in which I worked with uh, classified material and uh, need to know stuff and a lot of projects, uh, even to this day that uh, I, I don't talk about. But uh, I think that someone like Edward Snowden was in no position to make the, the evaluation that he did, that this is something that needs to be exposed. Uh, I, I would like to think that uh, the kind of uh, perspective that you get 
from higher in the organization is more enriched by knowledge of what the repercussions and ramifications and the price that will have to be paid. For example, uh, in the uh, in some of the release of uh, documents by Assange, uh, there were um, agents of the United States uh, who uh, were put in extreme peril and even some who paid with their life uh, because of his expose. I, I am not sure, I have no idea whether he contemplated the consequence of public publishing and releasing that information. Uh, I, I find it hard to believe that he could have understood the downstream uh, repercussions to real people who, who had uh, committed and were doing what they thought was the right thing as well um, and had to pay a, a great consequence for it. So, um, yeah, but, you know, I don't think he even considered where he would be years on from the event as a result of what he did. Are you saying that people died as a result of his uh, of his leaks? I'm led to believe that there uh, were included names of uh, agents that were used by some of our intelligence agencies on the ground in uh, foreign countries uh, who were put at great risk, who were compromised, who, whose lives were upturned, and, and uh, in a few cases, uh, they disappeared. Wow. So uh, that's the consequence. I mean, you can't, uh, uh, you know, um, in pursuit of, of each country's national interest, uh, if you remember uh, uh, the case of Jonathan Pollard back in the, uh, I think it was late 80s, early 90s, uh, when he was he was a uh, an employee of the uh, U.S. Navy, civilian employee, not a uniformed guy, but a civilian analyst for the United States Navy, and he was acting as an agent for Israel. Uh, Israel's not our enemy, as a matter of fact. At the time, then and now, uh, Israel's an ally, but he was giving them classified information for which uh, he was not authorized to give, and they were not authorized to receive. So they were spying on us. Uh, yes, uh, people, our friends spy on us, and uh, I hope we're both sitting down, but we spy on our friends. So that's the nature of the world, um, but it has consequences. Uh, all of these things have consequences. It's a serious business. Let's come back to Israel. They're in the news right now. Uh, this is the uh, conflict with, with Hamas uh, and uh, the, the conflict in Gaza. Um, I find it interesting people want to take sides so quickly rather than just trying to understand it more fully. We have to we have to jump uh, on one side of the fence or the other. I, I try to delay that the longest I can. I, I don't understand what's happening. Uh, the phrase war crimes has been bandied about quite a bit. What's the conventional thinking? What's policy when when people jump the border and steal your children and hold them for ransom and it's time to go get them? Well, there, 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 are two, there are two aspects. Uh, this is a very complicated topic, and uh, I don't want to make it too simplistic, but okay. you've got to start somewhere. Uh, and uh, I think when you say war crimes, uh, you're referring, uh, there, there are two issues here. Uh, there, there is the Geneva Convention of 1920. And uh, if your country is a signatory to the Geneva Conventions, uh, then uh, you're obligated under that uh, treaty to follow its protocol. Now, there's also, uh, now when we went to, uh, they, they didn't dignify it with the term uh, a war at the time, but in the Korean conflict, uh, North Korea was not a signatory to the Geneva Convention, didn't feel bound by them, nor uh, did Vietnam, nor uh, did China at the time. Uh, so uh, when you talk about official war crimes, uh, war crimes uh, in, in modern days uh, are, are applicable to uh, the standards set by the Geneva Conventions and further refined because in, in law, both domestic and international law, precedent and uh, common practice 
come into play in addition to the letter of the law. So uh, the behavior of the Allies at the end of World War II in the trials at Nuremberg also play into what constitutes war crimes. So there is that. So there's a whole body of uh, jurisprudence that, that is dedicated to uh, the behavior of uh, military organizations in conflict. But then there's also uh, the International Court, which uh, resides in The Hague, uh, and they, uh, and also the United Nations Charter uh, and uh, other documents of the United Nations have defined crimes against humanity. So they're, they're, uh, the, the fact of the matter is, uh, when you look at uh, the, the current situation with Hamas and Gaza, uh, which is not um, a member of the United Nations, not a, a country in itself, uh, the, the idea of it, uh, if a terrorist organization commits a crime, is it a war crime or a crime against humanity? Well, there are certain uh, crimes that uh, have commonly been accepted as, as uh, crimes against humanity and uh, murder, rape, uh, and uh, crimes of that magnitude and type. There, there's no country in the world uh, that sanctions it or uh, uh, views it as anything except a, a capital crime, uh, as serious as you can get. So certainly the, um, the behavior of the individuals, they were not representing a country uh, they're they're uh, the uh, in the employ of, of of a political organization that runs this um, entity uh, uh, in Gaza, uh, which is not necessarily the same as uh, as the Palestinians up on the West Bank or the Palestinians in southern Lebanon. Uh, they're just uh, it was terrorist activity, but they were committing crimes against humanity, for which uh, there's just there's no shade of gray here. And uh, there is nothing in precedent uh, or uh, common practice around the world that says uh, you can reach back and rationalize uh, a crime against humanity by some bad thing that happened in the past. Uh, although it has been done and has been said, I remember when we were having, uh, when we were watching the problems in uh, uh, Croatia and Serbia in the 90s, and uh, there was a particularly uh, gruesome uh, event in which some very innocent people were, were killed uh, by uh, some Serbs. And uh, they were interviewing uh, one of the leaders of this little faction. And uh, they said, how, how could you do something so heinous? And he said, well, you have to realize the other side did something like this in 1540. Yeah. And, uh, if we're going to reach back to 1540 for justification for uh, crimes today, uh, we got a long discussion ahead of us. And by the same token, uh, the uh, apologists uh, for October 7th, uh, first of all, many of these apologists, in, in my opinion, if you ever want to exercise this in your, in just in your day to day life, when you meet someone like that, uh, ask them if they can put a pin in the map where uh, Gaza is, if they can uh, explain uh, what the uh, strategic and uh, tactical objectives are for the Palestinian people. You know, this from the river to the sea is a pretty wide open uh, thing. I, I think a, a lot of the college students who have rallied recently don't have an in-depth understanding of, of the on the ground realities there. Uh, my wife and I lived in, uh, in, in that region for 12 years. And we, when I left, I, I felt I was just scratching the surface of understanding the realities of the, the problems of that area, the challenges that had to be met. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, many, uh, certainly, and I'm not picking on Islam, uh, because the, if you look at the history of the Christian churches, uh, there are some pretty nasty things that happened a thousand years ago, 800 years ago, whatever. Uh, so uh, I do know, though, that uh, the, the, uh, the Muslims that we lived with and knew personally and knew well 
were some of the best people I've I've ever known. Uh, you know, religious and uh, upright, and mm. uh, not at all represented by some of these radical factions. So it's a very complex area. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. I do know, I do know that Muhammad's next door neighbor was a Jew, and that he uh, uh, when he got when his neighbor got sick, he took him food and helped out in whatever way he could. And uh, when his followers said, uh, questioned him on it, he said, uh, he's a human first. And uh, we don't agree on our religion, but uh, uh, you know, all I'm saying is uh, there, like with most religions, most uh, Muslims are really upstanding and, uh, and, and very moral. But they're they're not being represented by uh, uh, in some instances by factions that are uh, very good Muslims or very right. good at Islam uh, in in general. The uh, original question was not about whether uh, whether Hamas did the did the bad thing by coming over the border and taking children and and innocent people back. The original question was. This puts Israel in a very difficult position because now they have to go find their citizens and that talk about complicated scenario. At what point, uh, at what point are there any tools available to them that they should not use? Or is that not well defined? And I realize it's just for people getting excited at home. Uh, it, nothing's a war crime until it goes in front of a tribunal and it's declared so, right? Just talking about it as a war crime, does it make it so? No, no. Actually, uh, there's due process in, in international relations as there's due process for individuals. And that so, won't happen for uh, years, right, Mike? And uh, and uh, I, don't, I don't want to be Pollyanna, but I also don't want to uh, uh, paint this uh, with such a gloomy uh, uh, brush that it's irreconcilable. But the fact, uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, that it's it's a very complicated uh, situation. Uh, Three thousand people died at Pearl Harbor on December the seventh, nineteen forty-one. Five years later, six million Japanese were dead as a consequence of World War II. Uh, that's not proportionate. Uh, they killed three thousand, and ultimately six million of their men, women, and children, and soldiers uh, and military uh, died as a result. But they started it. So does that mitigate? Uh, yeah, I see you know, what you're saying. I'll leave this to people with more profound uh, insights into the, the human condition than I have. Uh, all I'm saying is that this is not unprecedented in, in our history, not just our deep history, but even our recent history. So this is, this is not an unprecedented situation, but uh, you can't rationalize. Two wrongs do not make a right. And uh, the ends do not justify the means. So if, if you can't accept those two premises, then we really have a lot of conversation. <laughs> yeah, we'll leave uh, that for a longer podcast. Yeah. You referenced Pearl Harbor, which was a, a big moment for the Navy. Uh, why did you join the Navy versus another branch of the service? I was a draft dodger. Uh, the what? fact of the matter is, it's hard. Uh, it's hard for for people to uh, realize that uh, uh, if I, the first draft, the first really uh, effective. We had drafts before. We had drafts of sorts in the Civil War. There was a sort of draft even in the Revolutionary War. But uh, the the first and we, and the World War One had a very ineffective draft. The first truly national draft came in 1940. And our uncle, uh, your uncle, my uncle, uh, our uncle Jake, uh, the first draft was in 1940. Well, before uh, the beginning of World War I, World War II, I'm sorry, uh, 1940, uh, the war didn't start till December the 8th, 1941. So he was in the, his number came up in the very first draft. He got drafted. Oh, wow. He, he left uh, Wyandotte in uh, 1940 and didn't come back until 1945. So oh, wow, I didn't know that. He was, in, he was in for the duration. He was one of the early ones. Now, so that was the first draft that worked. Uh, and it really worked in World War II. 
you and I have uh, uh, each have uh, six uncle, a dad and six uncles. Of of our of the seven boys, uh, my dad was a foreman in the bomber plant at Willow Run, uh, making uh, uh, B twenty uh, fours, and so he didn't go in the military. But the other six boys, in one degree or another, all went in, into the military, and. Uh, and that draft lasted through the war and then continued as a peacetime phenomenon uh, right up until January 1st, 1974. So I was in the middle of it and uh, I knew that my number was coming up. And uh, at that time, uh, things were heating up in Vietnam and, and I thought I had no concerns about going. Uh, into the military, but I wanted to go on my terms and, and get something out of it, so to speak. So uh, rather than be drafted, uh, I went down and applied for the Navy program that would lead to flight training and uh, become a pilot. Yeah. Unfortunately, I was accepted. Fascinating. Did you really eat rattlesnake? I did. <laughs> they, and they taught us uh, uh, at uh, in there's two phases to survival school one in, in a classroom but then when you go out and actually get in in uh, out in nature it's a little a little bit different but they they told us that uh, poisonous snakes tasted better than non-poisonous so the first day we were out there someone killed a brown snake and uh, 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 another was able to uh, kill a water moccasin and so uh, uh, we 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 cooked both of them up and uh, tasted them, and that brown snake was horrible. And, and the moccasin wasn't very tasty, but it was it was okay. Where was this? Actually, actually I got a letter from my wife uh, just before I went, in which she uh, she quoted some wag who had said uh, someone insisted that I try eating snake because it tasted just like chicken. I did, it did, now I don't eat chicken because it tastes just like snake. <laughs> In what state, was it domestic? And did what state did you reduce the snake population? Uh, it was Florida. There's a, uh, the uh, Air Force Base at, at uh, Destin, Florida, uh, near Fort Walton Beach. Uh, it's called Eglin Air Force Base, it's huge. I just flew into Fort Walton uh, for a talk. Well, Destin, a... Destin is like a, uh, hidden gem in Florida, that beach there. Very nice. The, the whole coast there, the uh, the so-called Redneck Riviera. Uh, <laughs> I never heard that. <laughs> it's really good. Uh, beautiful beaches. Uh, I haven't been to all the famous beaches of the world, but I've been to a few of them. Uh -huh. And uh, there's not a beach I've ever been to that had a better quality of sand and, and uh, water than uh, the from uh, Gulf Shores, Alabama, all the way to uh, uh, the uh, where Florida makes the the turn around Apalachicola. Yeah, nice. I'm enjoying this so much, uh, but we uh, we need to wrap up. I want to ask you one more serious question, and then uh, sure. one question that might help our viewers become more educated about these complicated topics. You had mentioned how uh, countries spy on us, and we spy on other countries. The most recent election was fraught with peril, partly because, uh, and I don't know if it has been proven, but there's a lot of evidence that a country as big as Russia was influencing the election, sowing discontent with mis misinformation. Uh, Facebook was in the news all, all the time about this. Um, first of all, um, is it true that other countries meddle in U.S. election. I, I, I guess. Uh, I guess the the end question is how can we spot this when it's happening so we're not duped, because a lot of people fell for this stuff. Did you just ask me? It, does the United States meddle in other people's elections? Is that what well, I, heard I thought? It was a reciprocal arrangement that we have interests mm -hmm. in other countries' elections. Mm -hmm. Meddle might not be the right word. Well, the fact of the matter is that uh, I'm not tipping any uh, uh, classified information. This is a matter of record, uh, historical record, that uh, the United States in modern times, and I, I say we, we took a, a different role following World War II than we did 
up until then. Uh, prior to that, we had a national policy of isolationism. Uh, we, we did not want to, we had uh, water to the left, water to the right, and friendly neighbors to the north and south. Uh, and uh, we thought that was just fine. All we wanted to do is be left alone and carry out trade. But those things changed as the as the world became a smaller place. Uh, and I, I remember uh, very well when I was in college, uh, one of the darlings of, of academia and uh, the common culture was Marshall McLuhan, who predicted the global village. And uh, we, in fact, nowadays have, do have a global village. Uh, in in many ways, it's been, uh, and I'm not sure uh, whether it's uh, we have it because of our ability to communicate in a much more uh, real time, sophisticated way, or whether those tools came because we had a, a global village. But I do know that the United States hands are not clean in this. That uh, we aided and abetted in the overthrow of the South Vietnam government that was led by President Diem uh, in 1965. I know that uh, President Allende uh, in uh, South America was uh, essentially overturned uh, by uh, operatives of the Central Intelligence Agency. We, we are in no position to be accusing other countries of inappropriately meddling in our elections. What our job is to prevent it is to keep elections fair, honest, and above board. And if we do that, uh, then uh, people can have interest or other countries could want something to happen, but it can't happen if uh, if we have a system uh, that is procedurally tight and uh, accountable, that has good checks and balances, and is fair and equitable. And uh, as far as I can tell, uh, there hasn't been uh, too much uh, evidence that there was any actual activity that resulted in uh, votes uh, enough to change the outcome of any election at any level, city, county, state, or federal in recent elections. So uh, I, when I was at the War College, uh, part of my responsibility uh, uh, with my teaching partner, I, I taught defense economics. And, uh, but uh, some of the things that we were interested in was uh, uh, treaty compliance uh, for nuclear uh, treaties. And uh, it, it may uh, interest you to know that the, the analog is very clear to the voting situation in the sense of uh, how, what kind of cheating matters uh, in, in uh, nuclear treaty relations or in voting uh, purity. And uh, there are those that say any, any violation, any compromise is as is totally bad and the whole system is at risk. Right. Others say it's only at risk if it makes a difference. And the third one says, you're not gonna know when they're cheating if, unless you catch them. So you have to resume it's going on and just live with it. And, th and that's kind of the way it is. We do our best. We, I think we have outstanding uh, uh, grassroots, uh, jurisdiction and oversight for our election system. I have great confidence in it. Uh, I don't think that the last election was compromised in any way, shape, or form. I don't think it's going to be compromised going forward. Okay. My, mom, my mom was the, an election worker for 35 years, and uh, uh, I know she and her colleagues uh, did a great job. <laughs> it's my Aunt Wanda you're talking about. <laughs> uh, it was so fun watching her live to be, uh, did she make it to 100, I think? 101. No, she was two weeks shy of 101. Amazing. Yeah. Good life. Uh, one last question. Uh, what do you read? What can, oh. what can we read that will help us understand these topics better? Because, as you know, uh, people aren't reading what they should be reading anymore. And when they do read, we tend to read stuff that confirms our own bias. I think that uh, that people read less uh, than they used to. And I know I read less than I used to. And, and uh, there's a good reason for it, which is the other media have improved so much that they're 
they're more timely uh, and in, in some cases uh, more comprehensive, but certainly more accessible. So uh, I'll just I'll just share uh, you can interpolate this the, the way you want. Uh, I listen and read the people that don't fundamentally agree with me more than I read and listen to the people that agree with me. So how are you going to have uh, a thought process of weighing both sides of an issue if you don't hear the other side? So I know what I've been brought up to uh, sort of believe. I know what I believe because I came to that conclusion on my own. I want to hear what the critics have to say. And so I tend to listen to podcasts or to uh, media broadcasts of, uh, of positions that I don't necessarily agree with. I don't just tune in to the team that I support. I, I tune in to the opposing team. Yeah, good for you. Again, keeping an eye on the competition. Well, I want to, I, I want to know why they think what they think. And uh, if they can convince me, then I'll think that way too. Sure. Let's close with uh, some commonality, both the Rotarians um, and kind of a funny thing. Uh, somebody said to me recently that, or maybe I read this, that that for the first time in history, video has become more important than the written word. It's one of those blanket sound bites that sounds good. I don't know if it's 100% accurate, but I was thinking about that when we were on a call. Uh, I'm on the Great Lakes Pets Committee. We're training presidents elects that are uh, coming up. And we have a, tr a secretary, a recording secretary, and she wants to get everything accurate. D. Brock, she's a wonderful lady. And she says, so could you just repeat that again? I want to get that right. And she'll interrupt the meeting because she wants to do a good job. And one time I just said to her, you know, D, we're recording this meeting. We have, we have the tone, the timbre, the pitch of every voice that's being uttered, every, every, every articulation. And uh, they just looked at me like I was speaking French. Well, one of, one of the best ways to hide something is to uh, overwhelm it with uh, trivia. Uh, and so, uh, yes, we record everything, uh, but because we record everything, it's almost many things are irrecoverable uh, because we don't not only don't have some don't have the technology or the knowledge of how to recover it, but just don't have the time to look at everything to recover it. Yeah. So uh, the, uh, another topic uh, that's kind of frightening in this is uh, as we are on the cusp of uh, 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 artificial intelligence uh, developments, uh, it used to be uh, you can't believe everything you read, yeah, and yeah. now you can't believe everything you see. That's so right. <laughs> just well, you know, the you next phase is even more terrorizing. You can't believe everything you think. <laughs> Let's, let's put it this way. I spend way too much time thinking and, and worrying about Michigan University of Michigan football. And I, I saw a deep fake uh, video of Jim Harbaugh saying some outrageous things and uh, which he had nothing to do with. It was totally contrived and artificial, oh. but it really looked like him. Uh, it sounded like him. And uh, uh, it, it was absolutely frightening. In, in a sense, as a harbinger to the time when you, just because you see it with your own two eyes, can you believe it? Yeah, we'll have to talk more about that complicated subject next time. Absolutely. Mike, it's been such a pleasure uh, being with you and uh, re re reacquainting myself with one of my favorite cousins. Thanks for the time today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.